the lecturing on curves, uh, which are, uh, of course, varieties of dimension one. And uh, in, in this context, a lot of the uh, difficult, uh, deep questions are more arithmetic. I mean, the geometry, as we'll see in the today's lecture, is pretty much simple and, and well worked out, well understood, so that all the subtleties and, and, and difficulties are more in the arithmetic. So the theory requires perhaps a more arithmetic as opposed to geometric flavor when we uh, focus our attention on, on one-dimensional varieties over, of course, non-algebraically closed fields. So, okay, so I'm going to give today a kind of general overview to the things I'll be talking about, sort of present you the general picture of the arithmetic of curves. Um, so I'd like these talks to be f uh, reasonably uh, informal, so um, if you want to ask questions, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and slow me down, and I'll try to uh, answer them. Uh, in exchange, though, so, okay, so I'd, li I'd like to be, uh, you know, open to, to questions while I'm lecturing, so to, to pause occasionally and... Uh, uh, especially if you feel confused, and then you should slow me down. And in exchange, though, I, I have sort of, uh, in my lectures, packed uh, one hour of material in each lecture. So I'll ask for your indulgence if uh, at some points I have to run a little bit over time past the, uh, the one hour mark if I've had to take time to answer questions in the course of my lectures. Okay. So the basic object that we're interested in, of course, in, in, in this entire summer school are Diophantine equations. And these, as you, as you all know, are systems of polynomial equations in any number of variables. So an exponent to xn equals 0. And traditionally, if we're number theorists, we're interested in the case where the polynomials fj have integer coefficients. So they belong to the polynomial ring uh, with coefficients in z. And of course, the most basic uh, question we can ask is sort of, if I call x the system of equations, we're interested in the system of I mean, the, the solutions to the equation, the set of uh, elements in zn uh, satisfying the system x. Now. Um, it's actually, if you want to be a little bit more modern, we can replace uh, the ring of integers by uh, any uh, ring of uh, integers of a finite extension of the rationals, <coughs> or even more, a ring of S integers where we invert a finite set of primes. So I'm going to, when, when, that, when, I'm, when gains a lot of flexibility actually, and one doesn't really uh, make the question much more difficult. In fact, in some sense, one simplifies it by considering more general systems of equations, where one replaces z by some <laughs> ring of s integers. So O could be typically uh, OKS, where so K is a number field, S is a finite set of places, finite set of primes. So finite here is crucial for the many things. Uh, and uh, OKS denotes the ring of S integers, so the elements which are integral uh, over K, except possibly at the primes dividing S. Um, okay, and so we want to study now maybe s this kind of uh, solutions, which we can interpret as the set of uh, ring homomorphisms from the ring of functions O of capital X into uh, the ring O where O of X is the coordinate ring O of X1 up to Xn modulo the ideal generated by F1 up to Fn. So we're sort of interested in, in studying this solution set as uh, maybe one allows perhaps the ring of uh, coordinates to vary over all finite extensions of, of the rationals, and maybe one allows also s to vary in some way. So this uh, system of equations represents the affine case, uh, where we, we, we study sort of simultaneous systems of polynomial equations. We can also... Uh, 
because this, what I, what I described here on this board is sort of the, the, the case of affine uh, equations. Uh, we can also consider the proje projective equations, projective case, where we suppose that um, all Fi's, all these polynomials are homogeneous, are sums of polynomials of the same uh, total degree. And then, uh, one, in, in that case, it's customary to, the, to write uh, for x of k, the set, I mean, so then this system of equations has an obvious solution, which is these, the, the tuple consisting of the zero uh, solution. We exclude that one from consideration, and we look at the set of elements x1 up to xn with coordinates in uh, the number field k, but we, uh, so satisfying this equation, modulo the natural action of k star. I mean, if we take any solution and we scale it by a non-zero element of k, we get another solution, and so we want to kind of identify two solutions that differ in this way. And you see that in, when, when one defines rational solutions like that, one sees that essentially there's no distinction to be made between integral and rational uh, solutions of such an equation because if you have uh, a rational solution, you can always scale it by something so that all its entries are, are, are integral, so sort of clear denominators. And so um, in this, so when one writes in this projective case, one notes that x of k is equal to x uh, to the co uh, solutions with entries in OK or to uh, solutions with entries in any uh, ring of s integers. So in other words, integral and rational points are correspond to the same Diophantian question. It's really the same thing. But I want to emphasize that the basic objects that we're interested in, that we want to study, are integral solutions to Diophantine equations. When I'm in the affine case, I'm generally looking for integral solutions. And uh, in the projective case, the study of integral solutions to this kind of equation amounts to studying the rational solutions to the dehomogenized version, where you set one of the variables equal to 1, essentially. Okay. So that's a way of unifying, in a sense, the study of integral and rational points, which a priori might seem like they have a different flavor. Okay, so the mandate I have in this series of lectures is to study the simplest, in some sense, non-trivial case of uh, Diophantine equations from an arithmetic point of view, which correspond to the varieties of dimension one. So, and those are called curves. So a curve is um, a variety over, let me just say over k for now, k being a number field, uh, defined by uh, these equations like this. Um, for each, say the set uh, x of c, the set of complex solutions to the equation, is a one-dimensional complex manifold, okay, so is one-dimensional. Well, this is kind of a uh, naive uh, sort of definition of, of what I mean by an algebraic curve. So but in the zero dimensional case, the Diophantine equation would just be a finite collection of points, so sort of determining solutions and so on is a kind of trivial question. It's uh, in the one dimensional setting that the, the question becomes interesting for the first time. But okay, so I, st I start by defining a curve to be a variety over K. But it'll be frequently useful. In fact, uh, if I want to talk about the integral points, I have to have given myself a collection of equations with integral uh, coefficients, which amounts to fixing a model for the algebraic curve as a scheme over the spectrum of the ring of integers. Okay, so we also uh, uh, we suppose. I mean, this will I'll be doing frequently in my lectures. We suppose that x comes equipped with a model, which I'll maybe denote by script x, over the spectrum of O, O being this ring of S integers of a number field K, um, so allowing, allowing us 
to talk, or to, 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 yeah, to talk about, to define the set of, uh, of S integral points, which are kind of viewed as sections of this uh, uh, curve over, over spec OS, OKS. So what are the basic questions we can ask about these equations? So, um, So maybe perhaps the most basic uh, kind of question is a qualitative one about whether a given curve has finitely or infinitely many solutions. So is x of O, K, S finite or infinite? You could ask for this kind of uh, basic result. Uh, the second is if the following, if the cardinality of this set of solutions is finite, if you succeed in proving that it's finite, you might ask to give upper bounds uh, on its cardinality. In terms of the equation x, the set s, and the uh, field k. Uh, but you can also ask for more things. I mean, obviously, when we look at uh, diophantine equations, any solution comes with a natural notion of size, which is, roughly speaking, the, uh, the amount of space you need to write the solution down, um, which is a kind of notion of arithmetic complexity. Those are encoded in what are called height functions, which you've been, actually, you're not going to be hearing that much about height functions in my lecture series, but you probably have, will uh, hear about them in, in some of the other lectures in this, uh, in this summer school. So roughly speaking, a height function is a function from the set of uh, S integral solutions for, to the curve to the positive reals. There are various ways of defining it, uh, um, but, but the, the feeling of a height function is always that it's, it's uh, meant to measure the amount of, uh, so if you wanted to store uh, a solution, say, on a computer, sort of the amount of memory you would need to, to do that, to, sort, to store it in exact form. That's roughly what the height function is, the logarithmic height function in this case. And OK, so we can define these things, which give a measure of the size. And then we can be a little bit more ambitious in the kind of questions we ask. But for example, if the cardinality of x of OKS is infinite, well, these height functions are cooked up, of course, so that precisely so that the set of solutions of bounded height is, for trivial reasons, always a finite set. I mean, you can only, you know, in a given amount of uh, computer space, you can only store so many uh, 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 solutions. So if this is infinite. You can sort of consider a counting function. Um, so you might want to understand the asymptotics of the counting function which I'm going to call um, nxb, which is the, set of the, 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 the number of points in x of OKS whose height is less than b. And you want to maybe know how that grows as a function of b. Uh, if the cardinality of x, o, k, s is finite, then you might want to understand something, say something, about the maximum of the height of p as p ranges over this finite set. Now, this question might look a little bit similar to that one, but in fact, it's a very different. It's actually much harder and a more subtle problem. This kind of uh, ans uh, a good answer to this kind of question leads to an effective procedure, an algorithm for computing the set of solutions. Since you just then, if you know an a priori upper bound for the solutions, you just have to range over, over until you until you reach that point. Whereas this uh, question here only asks for the number of solutions without specifying how far out they might be, and it's sort of a much weaker. We'll we'll see that when we discuss uh, in the next two days the proof of faulting theorem. 
And okay, then a, a question which is uh, maybe closely related to four in some sense is to, to, to give algorithms, effective methods to compute um, x of OKS. And this actually corresponds to very fundamental uh, theoretical questions in the subject. I mean, I know that in this, work, in this summer school there's also a, a kind of emphasis on practical uh, methods to, to compute uh, uh, solutions in, in, in practice, but also uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, one, uh, one is very interested in, uh, in having results that say that one can actually affect, at least in principle, effectively determine a set of solutions to an algebraic equation. This question is a fundamental one already in the case of curves, as we'll see shortly. Now, the answers to all these questions, so the, the, the basic fact, which probably many of you already know, is that all, the, uh, all these basic questions, the, um, ah. okay. Can people see here if I, if I put the board at this level? Can anyone, everyone see in the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, so as, as many of you probably already know, the answer to these questions depends a lot on the sort of the topological appearance, topological appearance of the set of complex solutions to the, to the, to the curves. Now, if you look at the set of complex solutions, let's assume that the curve is smooth. Okay, so assume that x is smooth, it has no singularities, then x of c is, uh, I mean, smooth uh, in the generic fiber, so has a variety over k. So it has no uh, singularities, and then the uh, set of complex points is identified, at least topologically, also analytically, with, the, uh, with uh, some uh, Riemann surface of a genus g with a number of points removed with a finite number of points removed. So it looks like Sg minus P1 up to Ps, where G is the genus. So Sg is a surface, compact surface of genus G, where I've removed the uh, S points. So So here's the picture for g equals 3 and s equals 4. So we have this surface with four punctures and three holes. Okay? So that's the uh, kind of uh, topological uh, 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 appearance of any. So, okay, so obviously when you pass from an equation to this, you, 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 you uh, squeeze out two integ integral invariants. You've obviously lost a lot of information about what the equation is. You can uh, package further these two invariants into a single number, which is called the Euler characteristic of x, which depends only on this kind of topological appearance, and which is defined by 2 minus 2g minus s, minus the number of deleted points. So this is uh, the uh, number which governs the sort of uh, qualitative behavior of the solutions to the curve equation. This is what I'm going to explain now. So the, all, the answers to these, to these five basic questions which I've asked here are really governed by this quantity. Um, let me try to. Okay. Okay. Oh. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that, but that's a crucial point. I mean, because we're all, I place myself in the context where I, I only talk about integral points. And so the, so I mean, the equation is very different, right? When you, when you remove a point, then 
you're looking at a completely different equation. See if uh, this will become a little bit clearer now when I do, when I discuss the three cases. I mean, it's not just you see, yeah. I mean. So okay, so what, what happens? So, so here are the, th the three basic cases. Um, the case where the Euler characteristic of x is strictly positive, which is the simplest case from a Diophantine point of view. Well, that corresponds to two situations. There are two possible situations, right? If chi is strictly positive, then obviously g has to be equal to zero, and s can be either zero or one. Those are the two. Um, those are the, the two cases, and then uh, we have the following theorem. Is the the, the uh, okay? So the theorem is the following three things are equivalent. So I have now an, an x, and I want to understand uh, the uh, integral. Uh, actually, let me just assume here. Uh, let me assume now that s equals zero. OK, so I'm, I'm only going to talk about the projective case. So that in the projective case, there's no, as I said before, there's no di difference between integral and rational points. And it's customary then to talk about rational points on curves, although it's not really uh, it's just a matter of terminology. So then uh, I can, so I look at x of k. <coughs> and OK, so the first condition is that x of k is non-empty. The second condition is that x is isomorphic to the projective line over k as a, as a curve over k. And the third condition is that x of kv is non-empty for all completions, for all places. So for all completions, kv of k, both Archimedean and non-Archimedean. OK, so this is a theorem that you might have already heard uh, last week, I guess, I would imagine, in some of the lectures on, uh, on rational uh, or close to rational varieties that you had in the first week. Well, of integral points. So in a few minutes, I'll give you an exercise which I will answer the question. Okay, so just bear with me for a few minutes. It'll become, it'll become clear in uh, The following are equivalent. Sorry, yeah, I thought this was a, yeah. OK, uh, yeah, so the, uh, just bear with me, and I'll, 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 I, I will explain that. So um, OK, so I mean, OK, the, 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 this one, uh, uh, the implication one implies two is the Riemann-Roch theorem. It's a nice, ap it's a simple application of the Riemann-Roch theorem. Namely, uh, so if you have a rational point on x of k, let's call it infinity then you can consider the space of uh, the vector space of functions that have at most a pole at infinity. And uh, that's two-dimensional by the Riemann-Roch theorem. And, and then you just choose a non-constant function in there, uh, call that phi. And that gives you an identification of x with p1. So that's the Riemann-Roch. So then 2 implies 3 is. Um, clear, I mean, it's obvious. And the 3 implies 1, which is the most interesting part, is the hasse minkowski theorem, which is the local global principle for, um, for conics. Or local, that's the local global principle for conics. So if uh, your curve of genus 0 has a lo point locally everywhere, then it has a, uh, necessarily a, a global rational point. So, um, this result somehow tells us that, in a sense, 
curves of Virginia zero are completely well understood, and I'm, I'm going to be say, saying basically nothing about them in my lectures. Uh, yes. Yeah, so for s equals 1, um, yeah, so for s, no, for s equals 1 in some sense the situation is even easier in a sense because now you've marked a point and so if the, if that, um, now okay, we, uh, so basically in that case when s equals 1, x is isomorphic to the affine line a1, okay? Uh, and now remember that I'm, I'm, I'm studying integral points, right? So this is the affine line over the spectrum of O. So the coordinate ring of X is just, um, in this case, just, well, it's, yeah, O of X is just uh, the polynomial ring in one variable over O, okay? So an integral solution to this equation, so maybe this actually already answers the question that, that you asked. An integral solution to this equation these solutions are indexed by elements of O. Okay, so, so x of O, in this case, when s equals uh, 1, is identified with O. Whereas, when s is not equal to 1, when s equals 0, so for the projective line, um, uh, well, we see that x of O, so this is for uh, g equals 0, s equals 1, and for g equals 0, s equals 0, and the case where x is isomorphic to p1, then x of o is isomorphic to k. It's in, by, well, it's in bijection with k. Well, these mean just in bijection as sets. So you can see that there are a lot more integral points on p1 than there are on a1. Okay? So removing this point actually places a strong uh, constraint on the integral points. Okay? So that's just the way that the definitions are made. Okay, so, yeah, so anyway, I'm not going to be saying anything more about the case of strictly positive order characteristic, but I just want to mention now that um, what you've heard about in the, the first week, and uh, you'll, you'll be hearing also in other lectures in the coming weeks, in the higher dimensional setting, uh, trying to generalize this sort of very basic uh, classical result for curves leads to a very rich picture for higher dimensional varieties. So we still have a lot to understand about the rational points on higher dimensional varieties which are either rational or close to being rational, questions like the ones I raised before on the asymptotics of the counting functions and so on and so forth. So uh, this sort of simplest case, when you of course when you pass to higher dimensions, everything becomes much more complicated and challenging and that case which is completely worked out in dimension one becomes very rich and interesting in higher dimensions. Okay, but I really want to focus actually in my lecture since this is completely uh, simple and worked out uh, I'm going to be focusing on the case of, of order characteristic zero and the order characteristic uh, strictly negative. Okay, so now let me say a few things about the case of uh, zero Euler characteristic. So let's now look at the case where chi of x is equal to zero. So here there are really two interesting, I mean, two genuinely different interesting cases. So g can be either uh, zero, or so let me just say this way, uh, gs, the pair gs can be either uh, zero, two, or one, zero. This I'm going to call the affine case because it corresponds to an affine equation, right? I mean, where I have some, I've removed some points. And this I'm going to call the projective case. In this case, the uh, complex points looks like a Riemann sphere with two punctures. And in this case, it looks like a torus. And um, what can we say about that, those cases? So after so if 
x of O is non-empty, then x has the structure of a group scheme over O. So I mean, it's like an algebraic group, but in the category of schemes over Specco. What it means concretely is that if you have two solutions over O or over any finite flat extension of O, any ring of integers of a finite extension of, uh, of K, a ring of S integers, then you can combine those two solutions to produce a third one via a natural uh, algebraic group law, kind of algebraic group law. And um, in this uh, first case, in the affine case, X is identified, you know, so you, you need this non-empty uh, assumption, of course, because the empty set is not a group. And you sort of take, you choose a, po a point in this setting and, and decree that that point should be the identity. And once you've made that decision, then you've kind of pinned down your algebraic group structure on X of O. So in the affine case, X over O is isomorphic to the multiplicative group over uh, spec O, over the <coughs> A ring of S integers. And in the uh, projective case, so in the affine case, you see there's really only one uh, model, I mean, somehow. Um, well, not quite, actually. I mean, uh, so this is not. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that these are, are non singular. And, uh, yeah. You mean under some special fibers if I make yeah, some strange blow ups? Yeah. 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 And it, uh, yes, and there's another problem that I'm thinking of, which is that um, I could have a twisted form, right? I mean, it could be that the deleted points are not defined over, so even over spec k, what I say is not true, right? Because they could have, uh, they could twist. I mean, no, yeah, but I mean, I'm saying, I'm, so this is not, I'm not saying that all x over or are this. I don't want to go into these kind of classification problems. I just said that this is a sort, of a sort of a typical example of the kind of uh, structure that, that uh, one encounters when one tries to study this. Let's just leave it at that. In the projective case, uh, x over o will uh, look like an elliptic curve. It will be an elliptic curve um, over spec o. And again, I mean, here, uh, yeah, I mean, I could be allowing uh, some singular fibers, but let me assume that the curve is smooth over spec O so that all the special fibers are also, all the reductions, modules of primes of O, uh, are smooth curves over the finite fields. So they have no singularities, either the generic fiber or the special fibers. So X is the same over O, not Yes, so that's what I said at the beginning, that I kind of assume that in, in, implicitly in all that I say, I, in order even to talk about integral points, I need to give myself a model. And the model I'm giving myself here even is a smooth uh, proper model over spec O. Okay. So, okay, in these cases, we have the following basic result. So theorem that X of O is finitely generated. Uh, in the affine case, this is just uh, essentially the Dirichlet theorem on units or S units. In this case, you see it well because uh, if X is GM, then X of O is just the ring and the, the multiplicative group, right? Of, and we know that the group of S units of a number field is a finitely generated abelian group. And in the projective case, this is the Morel-Weil theorem. That X of O, uh, that, that uh, uh, Morel-Weil groups of elliptic curves are finitely generated. Okay, so I'll say maybe a few things about that next week when I discuss uh, elliptic curves. Um, but yeah, I mean, in keeping with sort of the general philosophy of this uh, 
summer school that you start with the difficult things first and then go down to the easy things. I'm going to be talking first about uh, chi's strictly negative in the first week, and then I'll focus more on curves of the genus one and elliptic curves in the second in the second week of my lecture, so the third week in school. Uh, okay, so. So now I want to say some things about um, chi of x strictly negative. OK, so uh, here. The basic theorem in that subject, the theorem of Siegel and Faultings, that when chi of x is strictly negative, then the set of integral points x of o is finite. The beautiful result, which is very simple to state, not so simple to prove. So if chi of x is strictly negative, then x of o is finite. It's a finite set. Uh, so the affine case. This is a theorem of Siegel. So it was proved. Uh, and he, uh, let me just illustrate that by uh, giving you the, the first interesting case of that theorem, and the main case, actually. I mean, you can reduce almost everything, well, I mean, the entire theorem, to this case, which is the case where x is the projective line minus three points, which I can take to be 0, 1, infinity, over Spec O. So the affine case, I mean that S is non-zero. S is non-zero, yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, it just means that I've deleted some points so that I can uh, choose uh, an affine uh, model over spec O. So the first interesting case is the case where S is P1 minus three points. In that case, uh, let me just work that out a little bit uh, for you. I mean. Uh, uh, in that case, what is x of O? I mean, uh, yeah, what is, sorry, what is the coordinate ring O of x? Well, that's just the, the ring of polynomials in the variable x. But you see, you, you've deleted, so x is a function which has only a pole at infinity. So I'm taking this, this standard function which has only a pole at infinity on P1. But I also uh, have deleted 0 and 1. So I allow functions that blow up at 0 and 1, that have poles at 0 and 1. So the coordinate rings looks like O of x, 1 over x, 1 over x minus 1. And so that's my ring of functions, O of x. But now x of O is identified with the algebra homomorphisms from O of x to O. So I, the ways that I can specialize my variable, well, but then to give such a homomorphism, I just have to specify what x goes to. But x had better go to something which is invertible, since then I have to send 1 over x to the inverse, which has to be an O. And also x minus 1 has to be invertible, since this guy has to go to the inverse of x minus 1. So uh, you can see that, um, so if I, if I take um, an, an f in this uh, Holmes, then f of x belongs to O star. And 1 minus f of x also belongs to O star. And this, uh, so this number, this unit, is a, is a, it's a solution to the S unit equation. Um, for the, um, So, so uh, integral points on P1 minus three points correspond to solutions to this well-known equation, the S unit equation, which uh, and we know that uh, well, that's one of the basic consequences of, of Siegel's theorem that there are finitely many solutions to the S unit equation. Um, okay, so that's the affine case. And then the projective case, the case where X is a projective curve, was proven much later, and that's the celebrated theorem of faultings. So what I'll be doing in the next two lectures is to explain the highlights, the main ingredients that go into the proof 
of this uh, result. So that's my goal on the lectures of, of Tuesday and Wednesday, to kind of give you a, a feeling uh, for the strategy that, that, that is followed in Faulting's proof. But in the time, so, so in the time remaining, I would like to just say some basic things about, um, about curves. And uh, in fact, well, even before that, I want to say a few things about uh, the simpler case, which I claimed was uh, completely easy and worked out, which, which are the, the case of dimension, of dimension zero. So let me start by making a few comments about zero-dimensional varieties or zero-dimensional schemes over spec O. Uh, so dimension zero. So it's too, uh, of course, a single equation, a single scheme of dimension zero is too simple from a Diophantian point of view. But we can still co consider collections of all those and, and the questions about uh, uh, classifying all the, the totality of uh, schemes of, of dimension zero over spec O are very interesting. Those lead to some of the uh, very interesting still open problems in number theory. So uh, a zero dimensional schemes essentially corresponds to uh, a finitely generated O algebra. So I'm going to consider those. And I say that an O algebra R is, uh, so I'm going to consider th only finite algebras. And uh, I'll also consider only flat, so finite flat, which I'll abbreviate to FF, if R is a finitely generated O module. As an O module, it's finitely generated uh, and, and free. It's finitely generated O module, free O module. So as a module, it's just a certain number of, finite number of copies of O, equipped with a multiplication, okay? And then uh, I say that it's et al over spec O if um, it, the quotient R mod X is reduced. It's a reduced algebra. In other words, it has no nilpotent elements for all uh, ideals X in spec O. So the qu if the quotients by all prime ideals is, is reduced, has no nil potents. And we can consider the set, which I'll denote Sha OD, of all uh, isomorphism classes of um, finite flat et al algebras over O of rank D. So I fixed the rank to D. OK, and so now I, I, I want to state the classical result of Hermite, which is going to be uh, useful in a number of uh, proofs that I'll be giving later, which tells us that this, this set, so these are you can think of as sort of the collection of the zero-dimensional schemes which in the generic fiber have D points, but are smooth over, um, over spec O. Okay, so that's the geometric picture you can have in mind. And um, the basic theorem of Hermite is that there are only finitely many of those. So that's a sort of the kind of maybe uh, most basic finite result of finite result of algebraic, num uh, of algebraic number theory, which is going to be sort of the starting point for many of the results on that we have on curves. So, um, uh, Sha O D. So here I remind you again that O is a again a ring of S integers of a number field, a finite extension, and D is some uh, some rank. So I look at all these finite tau algebras of rank D over spec O. And this is finite. The cardinality is finite. And uh, sort of give you the idea of the proof or the sketch of the proof. 
uh, that so given an element R, an isomorphism class in Sha O D, uh, we can consider uh, the the field obtained by so the generic fiber of this variety, the, the, the function field of so O tilde tensored over uh, sorry what am I uh, R tensored over O with uh, the fraction field of O, which is K. And so this is a K algebra. of degree D, which is unramified outside the finite set S of places. Okay? That's unramified because of this condition that the algebra should be a tau, that this quotient should be reduced uh, uh, algebras for all uh, ideals of OKS. And so then uh, the, uh, the idea of the proof is Hermit is to bound the discriminant. So one can bound the discriminant of K. And so, you know, one can bound first the primes that appear in the discriminant. Those are only the primes in S at most. And then one can also bound the multiplicities. And then the next stage of the proof is to, uh, to show that there can only be finitely many number fields with bounded degree and discriminant. Yes. No, uh, for example, you know, take, uh, I can even give you something which is finite flat, but not even generically at all. For example, if I take O of x modulo x squared, okay, so that's a nice algebra of rank two. As a no module, it's just two copies of O, okay, but who, who are, you asked the question. Yeah, you, sorry. Yeah, so it's sort of two copies of O, but it has a nilpotent element. So et al is much stronger. So you, you don't want nilpotent, it's not only a generic fiber, so when you tensor with, with K, but also when you reduce modulo various ideals, you don't want to have, you don't want to acquire nilpotents. And if you look at what that means, that means that basically the, if you kind of take a good, that it's possible to find a good defining equation at every prime outside of S for which the equation doesn't have multiple roots. And that's, uh, sort of equivalent to this. So the more classical way that you might, I mean, if you're more of a, an algebraic number theorist than a geometer, you would have heard this theorem stated as the statement that there are only finitely many number fields of bounded degree and discriminant, and that's, that's a, it's an elementary thing to work out with two. Yeah. You would yeah, that's part of flat. That's just, I mean, the meaning of flat in this context. Okay, so this is just a definition. I mean, I say that it's finite flat if it's a finite generative free or module. I think give you the independent. If you know it, good. Uh, otherwise, don't worry. Uh, meaning of uh, yes, one can bound this current, of course, of of uh, of, a, of L over K, yeah, <coughs> of that relative extension. <coughs> and then yeah, and then uh, one can show one one shows there are finitely many fields of uh, bounded degree and discriminant. Okay. So. And that finite result is going to be very useful to us uh, in, uh, well, in tomorrow's lecture, actually. Oh, when I say the word place? Okay, you, so you're asking uh, about why? Why do I say S is finite? Oh, I've just given myself a finite set. Okay, I could allow this set to vary eventually. But the kind of basis, when I, when I talk about integral points, I don't just want to talk about points with, um, with coordinates in the ring of integers of a finite extension of the rationals, but I also want to allow myself denominators eventually. But the denominators I, I can allow are kind of bounded by the primes. I give myself a finite set of primes 
where, where I, and I invert those primes. So the, the, then the uh, OKS is what's called the ring of S integers. They're elements whose denominators involves only the primes in S. Okay, so part of my data is this base, this ring O, and O is the set of elements. Uh, yeah, no, no. S depends on O. See this O, this ring O. So I'm look. I'm classifying finite flat extensions of O, but O was just an abbreviation. So maybe I should have made this. Well. Here, um, here in this theorem of Hermite, O is the ring of S integers of a number field. Okay, this is not a general result, of course. Huh? I mean, if I, if I inverted infinitely many primes, for example, it would cease to be true. Or if I put here, for example, uh, K instead of O, this would be completely false. Right? I mean, then you'd be classifying ext uh, field extensions or products of field extensions of, of degree D of, of, of a field, which are, which are infinitely many. But, but working over this base kind of puts a restriction on the discriminant, and that's exactly the point. Okay. okay. So, um, fine. Now, I just want to uh, say one last thing before I end. I want to make a remark. Uh, Yes. So R is a up to, right, I mean, so it's an, it's, it's an isomorphism class uh, as O algebras, as algebras over O. Okay, and then uh, I take this R. Oh, you're saying if I tensor with um, the fra Yeah, yeah, well, uh, no, not in this context, right? Not in, not in, uh, no, 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 maybe. No, it, it could. It could. You're right. That's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe not, actually. Maybe not. It could. It could not. Yeah, but, but, but this, this assignment for passing from the, the, the scheme to its generic fiber is finite to one. Yeah, so there's a, a little sleight of hand there. I mean. Okay. It's not hard to see, actually. It's finite to one. I mean. Okay. Um, So in the time remaining, I want to just say a little, uh, sort of a useful, a very useful fact actually, relatively elementary, about unramified coverings and the relation uh, of the behavior of rational points between curves that are related by an unramified map. So I want to talk about unramified coverings and their sort of arithmetic applications. So I say that a finite morphism pi from a curve x to a curve y. So these are still over uh, spec O. So remember that I had this integral model floating around. So I, I, I'm, and I'm going to call these unramified only if, if the generic fiber is unramified, if, only if the map is unramified in the generic fiber. So over, uh, so, so I'll say that it's called, uh, well, or, or rather I will call it, is called by me. So this is maybe not completely standard. Uh, uh, terminology, unramified, okay, if the induced map of Riemann surfaces uh, from x of c to y of c is unramified, for some embedding of O into c. So I just choose a complex embedding of the base and the uh, I require that the resulting uh, covering map of Riemann surfaces be unramified. And actually, if it's unramified for one embedding, it's going to be true for all. Yeah, so it sort of means that on the generic fiber, the morphism is unramified. Now, I want to uh, state a useful lemma. So whenever you have two curves 
that are related in this way, you can ask sort of what the relation between the rational or the integral points rather on one and the other. And it turns out that um, one can say something interesting or useful, at least, useful lemma. And the useful lemma is the following. So if pi from x to y is unramified in this sense, uh, then there exists a finite, there exists a finite extension L of k and a finite set S prime of, of primes or places of, uh, of L actually containing S or rather containing all the primes of L above S such that Um, the set of <coughs> S integral points, so I'm interested in kind of understanding the set of S integral points over K of Y, of this curve which is in the image. And the point is that that is contained in the set of S integral points of, uh, of S prime integral points over L of S for some, uh, so for some finite L and some finite S prime. And the key point is that this extension does not depend. I mean, so from that, you, you, you get all the solutions to y over l, or, or all the s integral points, sorry, sorry, to y over k, are kind of dominated by points in this finite extension and uh, this, um, this uh, yeah. OK, so, um, okay, so let me give you the proof of that. Okay, so Yeah, I mean, so this is a bit of a, a kind of a abuse of a, so I'm identifying S with a set of places of L above S. So let me call that maybe S tilde. I, I don't want to make it too heavy, but so, so places of L above S. Yeah. So are there any questions about this maybe? I mean, okay. Uh, if you're a bit confused about the statement, I, I'll, I hope the proof will clarify uh, what I mean. So, okay, uh, the, so I'm going to, so the first fact, so, so the proof of this result begins with the following fact. So I, give, I, I have this, so um, if pi from x to y is unramified in the sense that I stated, before, sort of in, on the generic fiber, then there exists a finite set, then there exists an S prime containing S, maybe, or that I, that I can take to be containing S, S prime being a finite set of places, such that pi um, from x to y, so I look at these models over the base OS prime, the set, set of S integers of k, of S prime integers of k. So I've inverted now the primes in this possibly larger set S prime. Uh, so this is a tau in the usual sense, in the stronger sense, a tau not just on the generic fiber, but all, on all the special fibers. Well. That's sort of an elementary fact because the condition for being a tau, for the cover to be a tau, is basically the condition of non-vanishing of a certain discriminant of the defining equation for the covering. Okay, so the, the condition of being generically a tau is that this discriminant is non-zero. It's not a zero, which is a number. I mean, it's, it's non-zero. And then 
you just take S prime to be the set of all the primes, those are, those are bad ones, for which in the special fiber, the covering ceases to be a tau, you can take S prime to be the set of all primes dividing that discriminant, and that's, that's enough. Once you've inverted those, to ensure that uh, the covering is a tau on, the, on, on all the special fibers as well as the generic fiber. So this is a tau as a covering, so as a, a covering of schemes over the spectrum of O, K, S prime, okay? This is really yeah. Now now I'm still over K. I haven't yet had I haven't yet had to pass to L, to L to a finite extension. Um, okay, but now we use the fa uh, basic fact of uh, uh, that if we now look at um, so in particular um, if we look at um, uh, for all points P in, uh, let's see, what I'm, I'm going X to Y. So Y of O, K, S prime. I can look at the fiber, the scheme theoretic fiber of uh, pi over the point P, uh, which means, uh, you know, you just sort of, in concrete terms, you take this point P and you look at the inverse image, you get a bunch of points in X, and you look at the field of definition, essentially, the coordinate ring of this bunch of points, and that's the, this fiber. So it's a, a finite flat algebra over spec O, but the fact that this covering is a tau over spec O K S prime ensures that this fiber is also a tau. So in particular, for all P, the fiber pi star of P is an a tau. O, K, S prime algebra. Hence, it belongs to Sha of O, K, S prime, D, where D is the degree of pi. But now, we saw from this, uh, the, the theorem of, uh, of R's, as R ranges over Sha O, K, as prime d. Okay, and uh, this is finite, so, so this is a finite extension. L over k is finite by Hermite, and that's the key point in the proof. Okay, so, and now let me just finish with a, 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 ba a basic, a key corollary of this, uh, of the proof of this theorem. What is it? What is pi star p supposed to be? Pi star p. Yeah, this is fiber. Okay. So. Yes. Right. So I mean, it's the coordinate ring. I mean, if you think geometrically, it's the coordinate of the phi of the of the uh, the coordinate ring of the fiber, right? The scheme theoretic fiber. So it's um, the fiber is spec of that algebra. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this case, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, or if you, okay, if you want, I mean, yeah, if I want to be consistent in my terminology, I guess, and, and I'm stick to this geometric, uh, I'll just say, uh, is spec of, right? An etal. Okay, that's. If you, yes. Yeah. yeah. Here I'm just taking the fraction field. Yeah, yeah, good, good point, yes, because I didn't say that these, these fibers, of course, need not be fields. Right. They could be, pro I mean, the generic fiber, they could be products of fields. So I'm taking the total ring of fractions, yeah. Okay, so finally, let me just state a, co a consequence. We'll be right here because I'm almost done. Um, so, uh, so it's a sort of a kind of elementary result, which maybe, at least in my mind, makes the uh, Mordell conjecture, which was proved by faultings, a little bit believable, or maybe kind of explains why there's a kind of a, a clear distinction between curves of a genus greater or equal to two and curves of a genus one. And so that's the following corollary, okay? Um, 
So uh, before I say the core, I need, to make, I need to make a definition. So I say that x, that the curve x, is Mordelic if it satisfies Mordell's conjecture in the sense that x of O L S is finite for all finite extensions of K and for all S uh, finite set of places of L. So if it satisfies the condition of this uh, of this uh, Siegel uh, faulting sphere, which I stated earlier, that sort of it has finite many asymptotic points for all finite extensions. Then I, I, I say that the, the variety, or the, in this case, the curve, is Mordelic. Mordelic means because it satisfies Mordell's conjecture. And the corollary of what I said before is that if two curves are related by an unramified covering, then one is Mordelic if and only if the other is. So then, x is Mordelic if and only if y is Mordelic. And that's an interesting statement because you see when two curves are related by an unramified covering, if the curve y has genus greater or equal to, I mean, greater or equal to two, then the genus of x could be much bigger. You'll see an example in the exercises, and it's an easy consequence of the Riemann-Hurwitz formula. So the genus could go up. And so, of course, the interesting implication <coughs> is the one where you go um, from uh, the, uh, the, the, this one, right? I mean, so where you deduce that y is more delicate, assuming that uh, x is Mordelic. And this follows from the fact that, so if I want to so study y of OLS, or let me, yeah, sorry, y of OKS. Well, no, I'm, well, what I'm saying in my crawl is that both are equivalent. And I'm saying that the interesting implication is this one. Yeah, I think I, this is right, the way I stated it. Exactly. Yeah, there's one which is completely trivial. Right. Again, this is the interesting one. Okay, so I'll explain why, and then you can, we can see if, I'm, if you still disagree with me. So you take y of OKS, okay? Now, so, so in other words, what I'm trying to do now is show that y is more delicate. So that y has finitely many uh, s-integral points over any, over any finite extension k, right? So how do I uh, prove this? Well. By my previous result, I know that this is contained in pi of x of O L S prime for some finite extension uh, L of k and some finite set S prime containing S. Now, by assumption, x is more delicate. So this is finite, therefore this is finite. Okay, the other, imp okay. Uh, this implication is, is, should be trivial. Okay, why is that? Well. Um, it's maybe easier to see it by when you, when you look at the contrapositive. I mean, uh, if x is not Mordelic, then y is not Mordelic. Because if x is not Mordelic, there exists some finite extension where I have infinitely many rational points, and then mapping them down by pi, I'm going to get infinitely many rational points on y. So, and in fact, you see, this, this, this boring direction doesn't use the fact that pi is unramified. Uh, this one does. I mean, uh, this is sort of the beef. Okay, so that's basically where I want to uh, leave you with. So it's the, the, the idea that when, cur when curves are related by certain uh, coverings and ramified ones or unramified correspondences, the questions concerning uh, the model conjecture or, or rational points and so on are not, on, uh, not at all unrelated. That's going to be actually an important theme of, of my lectures. So I'm going to finish now. I apologize for running a bit over time with a uh, board of exercises. Those of you who want to work on uh, the exercise session uh, in the evening, you can take down these exercises. These are good things to think about, uh, which are applications of the results that I explained uh, in these lectures, in this, in this first lecture. And in the after, in the, um, this afternoon, there's going to be a lecture by, uh, actually, I'm going to take this, let me just mention it here. There's going to be a lecture by Hugo Chapdelaine, which is going to be concerned with an equation 
which ostensibly falls a little bit outside the realm of curves, namely the so-called generalized Fermi equation, x p plus y q equals e to the r, where the exponents are allowed to be different. So this is a non-homogeneous equation in three variables. So it looks a bit like a surface. In fact, it is a surface. But Hugo is going to explain how the kind of basic uh, notions that I introduced in today's lecture can be used somehow to study this uh, equation. Okay, so that's going to be uh, uh, in Chapdelaine's lecture, which is uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, and so, so this is sort of like the, 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 in some sense, the most, the, the most basic notions. And we'll be using these notions throughout the, the series of lectures, particularly tomorrow and on Wednesday when I talk about the proof of faultings. Yes? So in number two, is, is that supposed to be showing that x is all divided by any time x is all Exactly, yes. What, what so I take. No, 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 this is, just, this is an integer, I'm sorry. n is just uh, some, uh, well, I mean, I guess, yeah, n greater or equal to 1. OK? So, so it's, it's the, the weak model of A theorem in this setting. OK? So I'm, I'm, what I'm claiming really is that the ideas that I've explained today, particularly this last uh, lemma on unramified coverings, is what you need to prove the weak model of A theorem. Those of you who have never seen the proof of the weak model of A theorem, this is a very good exercise. And uh, maybe I should say that also, particularly for part one, you might need, well, I don't know, depending on how clever you are. I mean, you, you, if, you, if you're stuck, then ask people who are more experienced. But in principle, what I told you today is enough to really tackle these questions. I mean, the last one, you might need to, to know some facts, like uh, uh, basic facts, like Riemann Hurwitz and so on. Uh, Again, I mean, if, you're, if you feel that you need to know something that to tackle these questions, ask me or someone in the, in the audience who knows a bit more. <laughs>